for 30 years uh, and been growing other succulents since he was a child. He is the Emeritus Director of the of research for the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum, has taught classes at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, his interests uh, include classification, evolution, ecology, conservation of Dudley and other plants. It's not an overstatement to say that Steve is one of the world's foremost experts on Dudley, and we're pleased that he is with us tonight. Uh, he has been in the forefront of efforts to preserve rare Dudleya from poachers, from fire, and from extinction. Uh, in addition to Dudleyas, he is a rock climber, uh, and he also enjoys hybridizing Dudleya and similar species. So let me turn it over to you, Steve. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for that uh, very nice introduction. Let's see if we can uh, get the uh, program up there. How's that look? Are you seeing the- uh... it, looks, it looks great. Okay. All right. Well, um, I, I appreciate the uh, introduction and you inviting me here. Um, I looked through the list of participants and uh, I see several names I recognize. Uh, hello to all my friends and hello to all those folks who decided to uh, tune in, uh, even though I haven't met you yet. Um, Dudleya uh, grow in different habitats, uh, and that's why I came up with the title. They, they hang onto cliffs, and in some cases, they grow on flat ground. Uh, and one or the other might surprise you, depending on um, where you've seen the Dudleya uh, so far. And uh, so let's see if we can, ah, yes we can get it to uh, advance. So I'm gonna talk about growing Dudleya, <clears throat> uh, poaching, fire, and other threats to the Dudleya. Uh, some of the responses that people have had or, or could have uh, to poaching. Um, maybe a little bit of uh, adventure conservation. Um, new cultivars that I'm working on, potential um, things that uh, folks might be interested in. Uh, right down the lower screen there is one of the many red hybrids that I've been working on. And then um, I'll uh, be talking about some of the California species and, uh, and um, possibly some new species to be named. Um, I will cover at least a couple of things uh, from your specific area, uh, mentioning Dudleya farinosa and Dudleya cespitosa. And then at the end, um, we're gonna have time for questions. So, uh, some places, uh, they really do grow on the cliffs. Uh, there's me uh, roped up and uh, quite a ways off the ground. And then on the right, you see the, uh, the Dudleya growing uh, with uh, little ferns and selaginella, uh, just in cracks in the rock, uh, in a place where they can get excellent drainage, cool roots. Um, the leaves may get hot, but the, but the roots uh, can help keep the plants uh, cool, and uh, their summer dry, or at least fairly dry. Now, one of the, um, I guess, myths uh, in some respects is uh, people say, oh, you don't water your Dudleya in the summer. Uh, and uh, there are certain plants in certain places where that might be accurate, uh, but many of the Dudleya benefit from at least occasional summer water. Uh, depending on what species they are. And, you know, if you're right on the coast versus a place like Sacramento. I know we have at least one Sacramento uh, attendee to this meeting. So I hit the advance button. Let's try it again. Oh, there we go. Uh, so some of the plants uh, grow on mesas uh, in Southern California. And so they'll grow in maybe two, uh, three centimeters of clay soil on top of volcanic mesas. Um, many of these, not all of them, but many of them are, are right uh, in view of the ocean. Uh, so there is some uh, coastal uh, influence, um, but uh, two centimeters of soil is not a lot. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of debate about how to grow these. Uh, 
people say, well, they, you know, they're, they're super summer uh, dormant. Uh, I ought to put them in a really well-draining mix. And then other people say, well, they grow in clay. You ought to grow them in clay. Uh, if you grow them in clay, you have to be especially careful. If you're coastal uh, Marin County, you would be, have to be especially careful not to overwater them through the winter. Uh, if you're inland at all, uh, even more than four or five miles, if you had them in light soil, you would have to be especially careful uh, not to kill them from drought uh, through the summer. I'm about 10 miles inland where it gets over 100 degrees in my greenhouse quite a few times uh, through the summer. And so I end up, e even though, uh, you know, the, the, the common um, recommendation is to never water them, I water them every couple of weeks uh, through the summer. And I have have them in moderately solid soil. Um, when I was closer to the coast, I let them dry all summer and I put uh, two layers of shade cloth over them. So you have to adjust it to your conditions uh, with, with many things, uh, you know, it's the same in horticulture. Now you, you might read, okay, well, I've got Dudley cymosa cymosa. Uh, how do I treat it? On the left, you see some from about 6,000 feet uh, growing on bare granite uh, in the Sierra Nevada. And then you have some in um, Santa Clara County uh, growing with moss and three or four kinds of ferns. Uh, they're both um, theoretically deadly as cymosis cymosa. Uh, and um, it's, it's tough uh, to deal with this, but no, if you do know something about them, uh, keep that in mind. Um, and uh, try and uh, mimic things at least a little bit. The things in the Sierra will get occasional, uh, occasional uh, summer rain. Uh, the things from uh, near coastal counties that grow with mosses and fern, well, they might dry out an awful lot in the summer, but a lot of times when you actually look at them, you'll see that they're in, in quite a bit of shade. Uh, so keeping, uh, keeping them maybe to the east side of a house uh, rather than the southwest face blazing sun uh, might keep them alive a little better. Uh, here's uh, just uh, one thing to uh, remind you to think about how summer dormant is your plant. The one on the left has gone completely summer dormant. The one in the middle is, is somewhat and the hybrid on the right um, seems to be just fine uh, growing and being watered all through the summer. So uh, one of the ways where you can tell this is if you look at the pot and if it uh, doesn't dry out on you, you can tell that the plant is not transpiring, it's not, not pulling any water out, uh, and use that as a guide uh, as to whether or not to uh, water it again. Uh, here are three plants. Um, we've got a Dudley Apachyphytum on the left that was grown indoors. Uh, I wanted to get self-pollinated uh, seed, uh, but it starts to look a little peaked. You get a little bit of yellowing in the leaves. Uh, if you grew it indoors too long, the thing would just die, uh, which is one of the reasons it's such a shame that so many are poached and taken uh, to indoor places uh, in other parts of the world where eventually they'll die. Uh, the, uh, the next one, uh, Dudley Apachyphytum, underwatered a little bit and it had gotten to 117 degrees in that greenhouse. Uh, not what you would expect for a plant that grows where there's fog almost every day, uh, but it managed to survive uh, because I didn't let it go bone dry uh, during the summer. Uh, and then there's a, a Dudley Pecchiphytum hybrid on the right, uh, but it's well watered and you can see, um, you know, it looks a little better uh, than the other two. So paying attention to what your plants look like uh, may help you um, grow them in the best conditions. Well, let's see if I can hide one thing here. There we go. Now I can uh, see my whole screen. Uh, so uh, this is a great photo I, I love uh, from Jeremy Spath, uh, you know, just illustrating how close some of uh, the plants grow uh, to the ocean. Uh, I've um, seen uh, salt spray and uh, all sorts of uh, interaction between the plants and the ocean. Uh, right down there on the edge. Uh, one of the things um, that you'll note is that 
a lot of these just, they want to experience extreme temperatures, even the ones in Baja, California. If they get, you know, if they get to 100 degrees during the daytime, it'll probably, this close to the ocean will probably cool off quite a bit uh, at nighttime. And that cooling down at night uh, really helps the plants um, that are from uh, coastal regions. Uh, here's another uh, view of uh, Dudleya candida. It's basically um, a, a Dudleya bretonii that's a little smaller and branches more. And I think these really um, have a lot of potential um, as landscaping plants, uh, as long as they're properly sourced. Uh, I think it could also be used in hybridization uh, to get some nice landscaping plants uh, to have these used a little bit more. Um, as I said, there, uh, you know, there's sometimes the influence of the coast. Here's me a uh, long time ago, um, climbing a five, nine route, uh, up to the Dudley. This is in the northernmost location in, uh, the, on the Oregon coast. And, uh, this rock is essentially a sea stack, uh, at high tide. Uh, but I could get out to it at low tide, just walk out on the sand and start climbing up there. And uh, really good uh, deadly Farinosa, but about five or 10 feet up into the deadly Farinosa, there were pieces of driftwood. Uh, so you know these are getting hit by actual waves uh, in the wintertime. Uh, I don't have time to go into an experiment I did about soaking some of these in salt water, but I think the salt water really keeps the pests down. Uh, so when you bring the plants indoors or into a greenhouse, you really have to watch out for mealybugs and aphids. Uh, and things like that. Uh, if they don't have the salt water that may be uh, keeping the uh, pests down. Uh, they get amazing uh, wind air circulation. Uh, so if you have a greenhouse, a fan is a really good thing, uh, as much open air circulation as, as you can get. Um, and so the combination of the air circulation and UV light uh, keep the fungus down. Uh, now, some of these are summer dry, but they have fog, uh, so uh, they really suffer if you let them go bone dry uh, all summer long. Uh, so I water mine uh, oh, probably once a week uh, through the summer. So that was a view of Dudley uh, Farinosa. People are most familiar with the, uh, the white form, uh, but there's also a green form, a, a non-waxy form. Uh, you can see sort of this beveling, uh, or you know, might remind you a little, little bit of bud printing in agaves uh, on the the leaves of the Dudley Farinosa. And this is this is from up uh, near uh, Point Reyes, but they're both green and white forms of Dudley Farinosa and Dudley Cespitosa, uh, which sometimes uh, confuse things, uh, especially uh, when you look at some of the written material. Uh, so here's a, a really good example, uh, especially the one on the right of a Dudleya farinosa with the pale uh, petals. Uh, in the upper right, you can see a close up uh, in that little box there of how the lower bracts are attached. They're kind of at an angle uh, to the flower stalk. And that's really characteristic of these pale flowered farinosas. Uh, sometimes later in the year, uh, on the left there, you can see uh, they get a, a narrower leaf and this narrow leaf one, this is one of the ones that was uh, confiscated uh, from a poacher and the, uh, the fish and wildlife people wanted me to pot it up and make it look pretty so they can show it off uh, to uh, some of the legislators. Uh, this was a particular plant that uh, we weren't able to put back into the wild. And then um, just as contrast, uh, one of the really good uh, characteristics for telling Dudley Cespitosa, uh, which you have in the Marin region uh, and Dudley Farinosa, which you have in the, the greater Marin region uh, is the petal color. Um, and so bright yellow to bright yellow green uh, is the Cespitosa. Uh, you can see a little bit narrower Corolla uh, than in the light colored uh, Farinosa. And I'll show, I'll show this uh, chart that you probably won't be able to read, uh, not all of you, depending on your screen. Um, but one of the things 
in, uh, in the Pharaonosis is that there's so many dead leaves so closely packed together uh, that you can't see the bare stem, at least for the first several centimeters. In Cespitosa, sometimes the stems elongate so much uh, that you really can see the bare stem uh, uh, in between. And um, another thing that I use uh, sometimes just as kind of a rule of thumb, if you look at, at it, could a honeybee crawl from one flower to the next? Well, that, that's gonna be a Pharaonosa. If you would think that the honeybee uh, might fly between flowers, well, that might make more sense to be a deadly cespitosa. Maybe a little more technical than some of you wanted, but uh, if, you know, if you looked at the Jepson manual and that doesn't work, uh, then maybe those clues that I gave you for some of your local um, deadliest might help. Uh, for some reason today, uh, it's, it's a little slow to click forward, but it worked. Uh, this is showing uh, Michael Benedict, who was uh, walking along on Cedros Island, and he saw an upside down rosette of Dudleya. And he was quite a Dudleya fanatic at that point, and he was really excited to see Dudleyas. So he picked up the upside down rosette. It wasn't attached to anything. It was just this upside down rosette. He turned over and looked at it and said, my goodness, this is a new species. And he looked around and he couldn't find any more. Uh, and who knows what had happened, maybe some scrub jay or crow or something had picked up a rosette and carried it a mile or two into um, the uh, Canyon de la Mina. But anyway, he came back later uh, with um, Reed Moore and Mr. Dudley and they found the whole population of them. Uh, and they found and named this uh, Dudley Apachyphytum. Uh, unfortunately, this is this, uh, at least for some time, was the choice plant uh, to be um, taken from the wild. When the first ones were collected uh, and put into botanic gardens in the late 70s, uh, the first plants were just stolen out of the garden. And then people from different countries would go out and collect, you know, a, a backpack or two full uh, and uh, spread them around. Um, I got seeds of them. Uh, years and years ago from Dylan Hannon and uh, grew a bunch of them and sold them uh, to the Cactus and Succulent Society of America and to the Cactus and Succulent Society of San Francisco. And I sold them at a real cheap price. And as far as I could tell, brought the price down uh, in California for a couple of years. And I thought, oh, well, I've taken care of it. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're tough to grow. And so a lot of them died and people didn't keep propagating them. And then later, uh, poaching became a problem um, and uh, people had collected uh, over uh, 4,700 plants uh, off of the island. Uh, and they were caught when there was an inspection of a truck uh, in Baja, California. It's really tough to get to the island. Uh, people were starting to get caught. Uh, people even took helicopters up to the top of the island. I mean, the way to get to, to uh, Dudley Apache fight them uh, from here is to drive to San Diego, rent a vehicle, drive another uh, 400 miles south, take a taxi to the airport, take the airport to the island, get a, a truck to a small boat, take the small boat to the north end of the island, hike up 2,000 feet in two or three miles, uh, some of it with a little rock scrambling or sliding this and that way next to agaves. Anyway, it's tough to reach. Um, and uh, people found out that your local plant, uh, the Dudley Farinosa, was similar in many ways and it was way easier to collect. And so people started collecting uh, Dudley Farinosa, uh, sort of as a substitute uh, for this wonderful Dudley Apachyphytum. And they were easy to get. And uh, it got to the point where people were uh, collecting and exporting literally tons of Dudleya uh, from uh, the Northern California coast uh, every month. Uh, it was just uh, it was just unimaginable how many plants uh, were being uh, collected and poached and taken away. Uh, unfortunately, around the world, it's not just Dudleya. Uh, there are agave, cacti, aloe, Madagascar plants, South African plants. 
uh, things are just getting out of hand um, with succulents being so popular. Uh, and you know, if you like a particular plant, you just hope it doesn't become the next it plant uh, for poachers. Uh, I participated, uh, I had oh, two or three minutes in the movie Plant Heist, uh, and that got out uh, some of the word uh, about uh, the poaching issues. Uh, Hugo Clement from Sur le Front uh, came over, they, they sent out, he came over and, and brought his director and a, a photographer, a videographer, and they were with me for 13 hours uh, talking about poaching. Of course, I was only on France 5 TV for about two minutes, but it was it was fun. Uh, Geo Magazine, Scientific American, uh, The New Yorker. There are a number of places that have talked about conservation issues and poaching uh, in Dudley. So there are a lot of things that can be done in terms of enforcement. There can be habitat preservation, which is really the best and really one of the things that the Native Plant Society works on the most. Uh, I've been working with a forensics team uh, in Sacramento. I'm not sure if that'll ever come to fruition, but uh, hopefully some of the forensics techniques will help out uh, like some of the forensics techniques they use uh, uh, to document and catch uh, people doing illegal uh, logging in the Pacific Northwest. People have talked about trail cams. There are undercover uh, people working on this. Um, they have tracked phones. Uh, potentially uh, looking at DNA, uh, potentially microchipping some of the biggest choice, most choice plants. Uh, the hotline, uh, the tip hotlines are uh, certainly um, up and running and nursery inspections. And then the Dudley Protection Act, which the Native Plant Society was the lead uh, in getting uh, taken care of and passed in California and signed by the governor. Uh, and so that gives law enforcement more tools. Uh, you don't just have to have it be uh, postal service regulation violations, but you can actually uh, use the Dudley Protection Act to protect them. I went out to um, uh, Point Reyes uh, with my wife. We were out there, we were looking around and I noticed uh, a bunch of Dudley that had been kicked uh, to the ground. Uh, they weren't very far away, but they were, you know, among the grasses and they were going to die. So I moved them a few feet back and stuck them into the rocks uh, right there, uh, you know, sort of habitat restoration uh, without a permit. Uh, but I figured it was better than letting them die right there. And I went back one year later and I matched up the rocks uh, and the plants and the salal there. And the plants were doing just fine. Uh, they'd added a rosette or two. And so, you know, when, when people ask me, oh, I, I found this Dudley, I fell down off of the cliff. Should I just take it home and rescue it? I will be protecting it and, you know, saving it. I said, no, no, just sh shove it back into the cliff. Uh, it'll probably be just fine. They're called live forevers uh, because they can handle some abuse uh, out in the wild. Uh, a lot of them can't handle the abuse of snails and slugs and deer and mealy bugs and aphids uh, and overwatering that happen in some of the gardens. So if you find one and it's a few feet away from its, uh, and it, from its uh, cliff, I'll just shove it back in the cliff and it might be just fine like these were. Uh, unfortunately, what I found out was um, about a year after this, I found out that uh, the undercover agents, uh, they were out there with night vision goggles and they, one of the, their biggest busts was right from the same parking lot. Uh, this is, you know, 50 yards, less than 50 yards from the parking lot. And this is where the guys were poaching was right where I had rescued those poor things. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, I'm glad they caught them, but it's nice when, uh, plants can be put back in the wild. Uh, when we have good location data, uh, when law enforcement keeps the plants not in a nursery that might have sudden elk death or other diseases, but the law enforcement puts them in a concrete floor in a warehouse, uh, and then there's a possibility of putting them back. And here, uh, state parks, uh, UC Santa Cruz Arboretum, uh, and, um, and some other folks, we work together to put these plants back in the wild in a state park 
uh, where the poacher had seen some of those earlier photos I, I showed you, she said, oh, people are making money shipping Dudley to China. My sister still lives in China. I'll go poach some, some plants and, uh, and I'll send them to my sister. Unfortunately, somebody, I think from CNPS, uh, noticed her, photographed her and her um, license plate. She had taken selfies of her at this spot with the Dudleya, and we could put the Dudleya right back where they had come from, and they survived and uh, are still um, doing just fine uh, there. This is a year later, uh, a photographer from Geo Magazine um, based in France and Germany was out here documenting uh, how Sam <laughs> was looking at the plant that she had replanted a year before. Uh, she was a, a intern and then a student worker and then a staff member uh, at uh, UC Santa Cruz Arboretum. And now she's just gotten her master's degree uh, and is up in Washington state. Anyway, kind of a nice uh, situation there. And this is another case of uh, people replanting native plants, even though these aren't Dudleyas. Uh, this was UC uh, Santa Cruz Arboretum and state parks replanting manzanitas on the side of a cliff. Uh, and Big Sur. I tied them off to my truck and said, yep, yeah, head on over the side, uh, but stay roped in. Anyway, that was that was kind of fun. And we got some manzanitas, uh, the Big Sur or Little Sur manzanita, if you want to call it that, um, we got those planted back out in the wild. Um, so I work with a lot of different people um, doing this. And so it's, you know, I'm, I'm just a, a a small, a small part of uh, all of these different uh, agencies and people working on uh, different aspects of this law enforcement, conservation. Um, you know, I worked with growing plants for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There's tissue culture that's happening, uh, botanic gardens with live collections, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and then there's seed banks uh, where if something gets wiped out by a fire, uh, we have backups, uh, the forensics lab uh, in Sacramento, and then uh, working on writing up uh, some of the articles that we're interested in. Uh, artists really help. You can't name a new species without an artist. Uh, so these triangles here uh, indicate where all of the deadly verity I grew in the world. And you see that outline uh, in orange, that's where the um, Springs fire went and it burned up uh, uh, somewhere between 90 and 98% of all of the Dudley of Aridii on the world. It was already uh, CNPS, uh, California rare plant rank uh, 1B, uh, federally, list, federally listed species uh, even before the fire. And then that hit it. Uh, there's been only a little bit of poaching there, uh, but that's an issue too. Um, and um, it grows with lichens. Uh, there's some speculation that the lichens may take 80 years to recover. Uh, there's debate about whether or not the lichens are essential. I don't think they do and other people think they are, but it'll take perhaps 80 years for the lichens to recover and really have a full uh, vigorous habitat uh, where these fires burned. Um, there are native moths, uh, kind of like this uh, snout nose moth, um, that uh, also uh, eat the plants. And um, so you, you take a plant, it's already endangered, you burn it up, followed by four years of drought, uh, a few plants are taken by poachers, and then they have the natural predators. Um, um, and uh, these uh, Every population I've ever visited has either had a moth or a butterfly uh, caterpillar uh, eating some of the plants uh, in uh, the uh, habitat. Now these tiny caterpillars, uh, they're incredibly good at uh, hiding. And th I think there are a lot of people who have watered their Dudleyas a couple of times in the summer and the plant dies and they say, oh, clearly I overwatered it. I'll never water them in the summer again. When really it's the snout nose moth larvae uh, that are killing the plants. Uh, I think the eggs are laid right in the center of the rosette. 
tiny caterpillar goes back and forth and kills one leaf. So if you see one leaf that's dying, uh, that might be a clue. And I think once the caterpillar gets large enough, uh, it can eat the stem and then it eats out the entire stem. Uh, all but one leaf is still looks good for another three, four months, but the plant is already dead. Uh, so that's something that's really cryptic. It's really hard to notice, uh, but it kills a lot of Dudleya in the wild and uh, uh, probably in larger collections. Uh, there are weedy plants uh, that can cause problems uh, for uh, just by overgrowing uh, the Dudleya, uh, a lot of them in the ice plant uh, family. Um, another problem is when you get cars, uh, you get nitrogen deposition and um, the nitrogen deposition helps the weeds grow. And sometimes if the weeds grow too much, uh, it might be that the seedlings that are trying to get started will rot underneath uh, the growth of weeds uh, or else when the fires come, the fires are hotter and burn hotter uh, in that deadly Verde eye uh, situation. Uh, the rock got hot enough that the outer uh, inch and a half to two inches of the volcanic rock just peeled off. So the habitat peeled off. Uh, and then after the fires, the, the non-native weeds started growing uh, back pretty well and pretty close to one of the highways. Uh, Michael Wesneff will recognize this uh, habitat. Um, we talked about that today. Um, if you want to grow Dudley from seed, plant them in the fall and don't cover them with soil. You can see the size of the seeds and uh, that's the head of a pin. So you can see the size of Dudley compared to the head of a pin. I think you can fit about five Dudley on the head of a pin. I don't know. Uh, but don't cover them with anything. And um, they're, they're pretty easy to grow. Um, and um, for me, they don't require quite as much um, care in terms of watering as things like trichocereus or astrophytums or aloes or gasterias, if any of you grow uh, those sorts of things. They're slightly more tolerant of drying out uh, than some of those cacti and, and other succulents. Um, I worked with Erwin Lightstone uh, on a photography project, and I just thought I'd show you this. Um, Dudley adensiflora, and uh, the tie to the previous slide is that I thought they were really tough to um, get them from seed. Uh, but all Dudleyas uh, that I've looked at, the pollen is ready before um, the um, pistils uh, are receptive to the pollen. And in Dudley adensiflora, I didn't realize you just had to wait another day or two. Uh, and then I can get perfectly good um, seed of these things. Uh, it's just some of them you wait a day or two uh, and some of them you wait two or three more days uh, and then you can get uh, all the seed you want. Uh, in one area where rock climbers were devastating um, a really rare uh, deadly cymosis of species of autofolia, it wasn't that special a rock climbing area, but it was a really special uh, Dudley area. Uh, state parks uh, and the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden uh, had permits to collect seed. And since uh, the access fund was gonna take out all of the permanent gear uh, that was there and it was gonna be really difficult to rock climb here, um, they were just gonna take it off the rock climbing radar. Uh, they wanted me to do collecting of seed there uh, and it was, you know, the access fund is a climbers group and uh, they were very cooperative. You know, they want to protect areas so that they can climb on them, but they were also uh, willing to help uh, protect the plants uh, in this case also. So uh, a win-win situation. And uh, um, I just collected, uh, you know, the, the amount of seeds that Fish and Wildlife Service said were appropriate uh, given that these rock climbing areas were gonna be uh, closed. And uh, a lot of tension traverses to get over um, to these uh, tiny little plants. So in 1986, Ted Kipping, who uh, some of you knew, uh, said, oh yeah, there's a bunch of Dudley Alinearis out on San Benito Island. I brought you one, Steve. I said, aren't those really rare out there? Said, no, no, there were a bunch of them out there. Okay, well, thanks. 
Thanks, Ted. And, you know, I just grew it and grew it. And uh, after he collected them, somebody released uh, English rabbits onto the island. Uh, so there'd be food for the lighthouse keeper. And the rabbits just devastated the habitat um, and may have eliminated all of the live plants of deadly Alinearis in the wild. And all of a sudden I was looking at my one plant thinking, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm in charge of the last plant of this entire species. Uh, again, this was a species that I should have waited another day or two to get good seed. So at first I took cuttings of it uh, to make more. And uh, then um, uh, Conservation de las Islas uh, were hired a hunter and the hunter hired his dog and they got rid of all of the rabbits and uh, Dudley Linearis is coming back uh, from the seed bank. It was such a short time. It was really nice that the, the plants could come back from the seed bank. And when I was out there in 2015, uh, I counted 500 plants uh, in a couple of hours. And I, I think I scoured the island pretty thoroughly. I was, I was moving pretty fast, uh, but I did stop to get a couple of pictures, but it, it tells the importance of botanic gardens uh, and seed banks, uh, if something really is that close to extinction, uh, having a little bit of a backup is, is a good thing. Uh, wonderful little plants. Uh, so this is uh, showing uh, some of the student workers uh, and uh, some of the collections uh, at UC uh, Santa Cruz Arboretum. Uh, one of the things that people have talked about is reducing demand. Um, my friend Kelly uh, Griffin, who, uh, who works uh, with a nursery in Southern California, uh, is responsible for getting a lot of Dudley Farinosa out into the big box stores uh, at really cheap uh, prices. Uh, I gave all of uh, the seed for these seedlings uh, to CNPS and a nursery in Southern California grew all of these. Uh, and so the idea is to bring down the prices uh, so people will buy cultivated plants rather than ones ripped uh, from the wild. Uh, another thing to do is uh, get out international uh, publicity and education for the reasons why not uh, to uh, collect things from the wild. I was interviewed by the South China News. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, anyway, we do what we can. Uh, to reduce demand, uh, including working on maybe developing new plants that might be pretty. Uh, these are some plants that I've created uh, by hybridizing different things. Uh, I, I think they're pretty, uh, and I hope other, other people do too. Uh, just getting really white waxy ones of different leaf shapes, uh, really working on ones that are not straight out of the wild, but they've been grown for a couple of generations in the wild, a little better able to handle uh, a nursery conditions. So the nurseries don't go broke trying to, to grow them, uh, but they're, you know, they're profitable for the nurseries to, to grow responsibly produced plants. This one actually looks a lot like uh, one of the really um, exciting echeverias uh, that's rare out there too grew one in a pot that Joseph Hidalgo made. Um, when people talk about aging a Dudleya, uh, I've had this, I don't know how, I think this plant has been in the pot. I'd have to check my notes to see when I photographed it first for about seven years. And it's the same size it was seven years ago. It's a Dudleya pachyphytum hybrid. Uh, it had a flower stalk about two feet tall but it doesn't change in size uh, over many years. So it's really hard to age uh, a Dudleya uh, if some of them uh, just look the same year after year after year. Uh, and here's another pretty hybrid that I worked on. And since uh, Dudleya pachyphytum or, you know, they're getting to be a dime a dozen, they're everywhere, right? Uh, he says jokingly, um, I've started chopping them up uh, some to see what happens. Uh, sometimes when you cut off a deadly apachyphytum or a deadly apachyphytum, the base will die. Uh, I cut this one off on the right and scored it, uh, put it, put an X through the center 
uh, hoping to get uh, four different branches coming up. Uh, the one on the left, uh, I, uh, I took a serrated knife and cut it down the center, used those little sticks to try to keep the pieces apart. And you can see uh, one quarter of this plant is producing a flower stalk anyway. Uh, and then what you can do is you can uh, take off uh, one at a time the cuttings uh, and not kill uh, the base of the plant. Uh, so you can get, instead of just cutting off the top, the base dies and all you have is a shorter plant, uh, you can get multiple plants uh, this way if you don't want to go to all the hassle of uh, tissue culture of your special Dudleya pachyphytum or uh, other hybrids, uh, among the things that don't branch very much. Uh, I should mention the Dudleya are really weird in that they, uh, many of them will just send their um, branches up straight out of the cut uh, stem rather than around the perimeter and the leaf axles like you would expect with almost every uh, uh, higher plant. Uh, but they're really weird uh, in uh, just shoving the, the stem right out, you know, shoving the new branches right out of the stem. Uh, here's a cultivar that I've done, um, uh, Edna's echidna. I think one of the things that's cool about this is uh, can really be abused as a house plant. Uh, a lot of Dudleys don't do well as house plants, uh, but this one has worked well as a house plant, as a potted plant in plastic, as a potted plant in uh, in clay, uh, and in the ground in uh, Santa Cruz and in the ground in Los Angeles. Uh, so it's uh, you know I mean there there may be showier plants, uh, but it's really reliable, um, and uh, it has been sold commercially at times. Uh, I'm working on some that have redder inflorescences, uh, maybe, you know, a little bit this or that might be, you know, might have the next generation might be interesting. Uh, working with flower color a little bit uh, among the brightly colored ones, uh, collecting seed, uh, working on leaf colors and leaf shapes. Uh, they don't usually look like this in the wild. And um, so, I started, I don't know, this is 10 or 20 generations uh, from the original Dudleya cymosa ovatifolia crossed with uh, Dudleya uh, edulis and then allowing them to open pollinate or sometimes intentionally pollinate them. But I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of things to work with in terms of trying to make pretty things that uh, maybe one of those uh, three guys in Southern California will tissue culture for me. Um, they're, you know, among collectors, they're wavy leaf things in echeverias. Uh, you know, I'm starting to get wavy leaf things among my red uh, Dudleyas and in some of the light green ones. Uh, maybe if I cross a couple of these wavy leaf ones, I'll get some of these bizarre things that, I don't know, maybe the native plant enthusiasts might not like as much, but maybe some of the succulent collectors would say, oh, I'd much rather have that uh than uh, a wild collected plant anyway i'm trying you know 10 different avenues uh for uh conservation of these plants uh there's some of my dudley apeki phytum hybrids you know out of you know 200 seedlings i might get uh, uh some forked or weird leaves out of these uh, i'm trying to propagate these from cuttings and i'm going to cross some of these with each other uh, and see if we can get some more weird things. Uh, working with flower color and shape, uh, producing things that upper right, there's nothing quite like that in the wild. Uh, the one in the lower left uh, is quite like some of the things from Northern San Luis Obispo County in the wild. And this is not like anything in the wild, this campanulate with that pink, uh, a little bit of wax on the sepals. And then just playing with petal color and leaf color and leaf shape uh, just to uh, make some pretty plants. Um, Here's some plants that you might find in a nursery that are pure species. Uh, Dudley Pelvariolenta on the left with the flowers hanging down. Uh, looks so much alike uh, the Dudley Anthonyi when they're in leaf that people get confused. But the Dudley Anthony on the right, you can see the flowers are more likely to be held 
uh, horizontally, laterally, uh, rather than hanging down, rather than pendently. Here's a pulveria lenta uh, that grows from Baja, California, up uh, through San Luis Obispo County, uh, with uh, one tiny population a couple hundred meters uh, into Monterey County, uh, at least one population that I know of uh, that uh, Rering Aiden found. Uh, Dudleya cespitosa on sand looks different than other Dudleya cespitosas. Uh, the leaves look a lot more like Dudleya lanceolata, but they branch a lot. Uh, so sometimes in sandy situations, you would see uh, this uh, uh, form. Uh, there are a lot of different forms. Uh, there are the Lucia form, uh, which is kind of a round leaf. Uh, and um, there's a plant called Dudleya frank Reinelt, uh, which looks some, similar to some of these uh, cespitosas. Um, anyway, if you see something labeled Dudleya anacapa or Dudleya frank Reinelt, it may or may not be labeled correctly. Uh, many of them aren't. Uh, but there's a lot of different forms of Dudleya cespitosa. I guess one of the key takeaways uh, that is clear from this slide is the Dudleya cespitosa, as I mentioned earlier, have bright yellow uh, petals with relatively upright petals. Uh, here's uh, uh, photos of uh, one selection that I call Lucy in the Sky. Uh, and that has been sold a little bit uh, around. It's a good coastal plant, um, not a good greenhouse plant uh, because the mealy bugs like it too much. Um, Dudleya palmeri uh, and, and palmeri hybrids. Uh, it's just a mess for a taxonomist trying to understand it. State parks, state parks hired me to sort out the Dudleya for them uh, in one area uh, of uh, of state parks and uh, I was just tearing my hair out um, because they picked one of the areas uh, that it's least likely that somebody could walk up to a single individual plant and say, ah, this is what species this belongs to. Uh, so there are some areas uh, of the world where it is really, really difficult uh, to identify uh, Dudleyas and uh, the north coast of uh, San Luis Obispo County uh, most of the Monterey uh, County coast, uh, parts of uh, the Santa Monica Mountains really present challenges uh, to uh, uh, amateur and professional botanists alike. Uh, don't feel bad if you can't identify every plant. Uh, this is a naturally occurring hybrid of uh, species that aren't supposed to be there that, but might be 15 miles north. Uh, it just throws, throws me off when I see plants that look like you've got Farinosa cross with Cymosa subspecies Pumala in an area that's definitely further south than they're, either one of them are supposed to occur. Uh, but I don't know what else you would call it. Um, and they're growing near 10 other forms. Uh, anyway, you just look at them and appreciate them. Um, here's some things from Baja, here's something from Baja, California, Dudleya rubens. Uh, uh, they've got a lot of rare species uh, from Baja, California uh, as well. Uh, Dudleya cymosa. I'm looking at the time. I think I'm going to go through the Dudleya cymosa part pretty quickly here. Um, but just rest assured that if you think, oh, um, this Dudleya cymosa, cymosa looks different from the last one I saw, then you're not imagining things. Uh, they just have uh, different looks to them. And uh, it's just hard to figure out what's going on. There's some work being done out of Santa Barbara Botanic Garden that's starting to shed some light on uh, these things. But one of the things that I think we'll really find out eventually is that they're a number of cryptic species. They're a little bit different from each other, all that have been lumped into Dudleya cymosa over the years. And we just can't figure it all out quite yet. Uh, I, I tear my hair out. Uh, and I remember what Reed Morin said after he'd been studying Dudleya for 70 years. He said, the more I know about Dudleya, the less I know. 
And it took me a while to get there, but I'm there. Uh, all these are supposed to be deadly cymosis, cymosis. So there are a few other weird species on limestone that you may never come across. Uh, they're just amazing. Limestone, Selaginella, and Hespero yucca. Nothing else. Uh, one, one set of cliffs in the Sierra Nevada. And this is related to a really rare species from the San Gabriel Mountains, according to the DNA. And that just makes no sense at all. But it means uh, that we will probably learn a lot over the next 10 years uh, about deadly genetics uh, and deadly evolution. What it makes me think is these, these hints we're getting from the DNA is that uh, Dudley have been uh, evolving for a really long time. They might be hybridizing a little bit now uh, or a lot now in different places, but the stories, they have a lot of really interesting, complicated stories. Um, another reason to save the, uh, the Dudley and all of our native plants are all of the pollinators and all of the pests, all of the natural pests, and all of the things that eat uh, the pollinators uh, and, and everything. You know, you, you've got uh, owls and raptors that eat the mice, that eat the Dudleya socks. Uh, we want to protect the entire ecosystem. So if you're taking tons of Dudleya away, you're affecting not just the Dudleya, uh, but everything else around them. Um, I'm working on uh, th that young girl who helped me with the research. I'm working on uh, training up her daughter now uh, <laughs> to help me work on Dudley. She was out there when I was naming Dudley and Noma. And uh, we uh, had a lot of fun out there on Santa Rosa Island. This plant has been around for a long time. It's sold by a lot of uh, nurseries in Korea and I hope they're responsibly uh, propagated. Uh, Dudley crassifolia is a relatively new species. Uh, reminds me of uh, Anacampseros or Haworthias, some of those South African things. Uh, they pull themselves down into the sand and there's a little clay layer underneath them. Uh, and they're hard to see. Uh, Dudley hendrixii uh, got us a lot of publicity uh, when we named that from near uh, a nearby geographic location to the Dudley crassifolia. And there are new species to name too. Um, uh, the one on the right is one I've been talking, I've been working with Dudley uh, with various people and including, I've been mentioning this to uh, Devin uh, and uh, Deb and we've been, <laughs> uh, I'm having a hard time getting words out at this point of the talk. I've been trying to cram in so much here, uh, Devlin. Uh, we've been working together on looking at uh, Dudley A. Bramsey eyes. Uh, there's a Silicon Valley uh, Dudley, perhaps. Uh, there's a Dudley on the left that grows on really steep cliffs, not that steep cliff, but grows on really steep cliffs. And I'm working with Kristen uh, Hassenstab Lehman and Matt Williams to name that. Uh, this is a plant that had an old name, but was never published. So it's gonna get a name from Cedros Island. Uh, this is a species on the right that we're going to name that Michael Benedict found. I'm probably not going to name it, uh, but he might work with other people. Here's a, a, a species, a new species that will be named from the Channel Islands. Uh, its relatives have really tall flower stalks. This one, uh, the flower stalks in a lot of cases, as you can see, don't outgrow the lichens. Uh, so really different morphology. Uh, from other things on the same uh, island. So far, we're just calling it White Star because that's what it looks like from the boat when you look at it on the vertical cliffs. Uh, here's another potentially new species uh, that the bumblebees seem to visit a lot more than the hummingbirds. And that bumblebee area, uh, fortunately, um, Devlin and I went out and looked and this white one wasn't all wiped out. Uh, by the fire, but uh, some of the populations uh, may have been wiped out, but we found a lot more of this new species that I thought there were only 250 plants. We found a lot more plants than that um, about a week and a half ago. So we're really, really excited that uh, some of the things may have survived uh, this wildfire that was started by a 
one, one of these wildfires just started by a gender reveal party. Anyway, I had to evacuate my Dudleys when the fires were coming down the hill uh, towards me. And, uh, you know, some of them, <laughs> we lost the, lost the flowers when we were closing the doors in a hurry. Um, this is not the last slide, but I want to thank a lot of people, uh, uh, and including the people from Marin who uh, set this up, Dave. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, arranging this and working on this. Uh, and uh, various people, uh, Kelly and Jeremy, uh, uh, Diana, who's helped repot many, many things. Uh, lots and lots of people have helped me over the years, too many uh, to mention. Uh, but the Native Plant Society, uh, some of the Cactus and Succulent Societies, uh, like the Monterey, the San Jose, the Henry Shaw one from St. Louis, uh, Cactus and Succulent Society of America. Uh, so there've been a lot of people uh, working together on all of these conservation issues. Uh, and one of the things I'm pleased is that, you know, there's some places where uh, things like this in the upper right, uh, they're already protected in national parks. Uh, and, uh, and then there are other places where these other two photographs, we replanted the Dudleyas in the state park where we're, theoretically they were protected, uh, but now they're growing again uh, a few years later uh, and they're doing just fine. So thanks so much uh, for having me and um, ha hope I haven't gone too long. Not at all. We have plenty, <clears throat> plenty of time for questions and we have three in the, in the chat. The first question is from Lena Zentel. Where are the Dudley uh, most often poached in Point Reyes? Well, uh, I'd rather not disclose <laughs> uh, particular locations, but if they're closer and easier to get, uh, you know, wherever, those seem to be the places. If you're four miles back on a trail and you're having to, you know, shove aside some of those uh, prickly bushes, well, that's probably not a place where the poachers are going to be taking yeah. them. Uh, Richard Ackley asks, uh, why is Dudley of Farinosa called bluff lettuce? Um, a lot of the um, Dudley uh, were uh, eaten by uh, indigenous peoples. Um, and so uh, it, it was a food source uh, and they grow on ocean bluffs. I mean, I don't know if it's my favorite uh, common name for them, but uh, yeah, they were, uh, a lot of them were eaten. And Eva Buxton asks, are molecular analyses used to identify the various morphological variants of deadly Um There's preliminary work being done on those, uh, but um, the funding only allowed a certain, uh, you know, a certain amount to be sampled. Uh, Really interesting uh, beginnings uh, that uh, Kristen is working on uh, at Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Really, really interesting stuff. It, it uh, but it's going to take uh, a really concerted effort, probably by a team, uh, to get it. Just that one subspecies, deadly cymosis, a subspecies cymosa. Um, the coastal and the, and the Sierra. Uh, are probably different. Uh, there are probably several different uh, things in the Sierra. Uh, there might be a couple of different things uh, in the coast ranges. Uh, I'm having a heck of a time uh, with the Dudleya cymosa pumila versus Dudleya cymosa cymosa uh, in the different uh, counties, the different mountain ranges. Uh, so preliminary work has been done on that, Eva, uh, and I'm really looking forward to more. And Clint, say hi to Tim. Clint Kellner asked, do you know the species of caterpillars that eat the Dudleys? Um, I am just extrapolating uh, from um, a thesis that was written by uh, Tom Mulroy, and he had them identified as snout-nosed moths. Um, there are also uh, some of the uh, Sonoran blue uh, butterflies. Um, those are, uh, I've, I've seen, uh, those are relatives of those in the Big Sur region and then down through LA and such, uh, some of the butterfly ones. Uh, they're, they're cryptic in a different way. Um, and they have uh, the same color as the flower. So bright, bright orange, 
in Big Sur and uh, yellow in some area, other areas, and they're among the flower stalks. Uh, but there's a subspecies of the Sonoran blue butterfly called Extinctus uh, that was around the San Gabriel Canyon. Canyon. That, that subspecies uh, is extinct. Uh, and um, to get back to Clint's original uh, question, uh, I'm just guessing that the snout nose, uh, there's some kind of snout nose moth uh, like the ones that uh, Tom Mulroy was seeing in Northern Baja, California. Lena asks, what kinds of deadlier do we have in Point Reyes besides Farinosa? So you have Farinosa and Cespitosa. Uh, you have both the, the white and the green form of Farinosa. Uh, you certainly have uh, Cespitosa with wax on them. Uh, you have deadliest Cymosa subspecies Cymosa. Uh, there are some uh, hybrids between Cymosa, Cymosa, and Farinosa, or at least they used to exist uh, somewhere in the vicinity of, uh, of Bolinas Lagoon. They're both uh, Cespitosa and Farinosa near the mouth of the Russian River. And in spite of what people had thought before, deadliest Cespitosa gets further up all the way up into um, the Lost Coast. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I, I checked the marine flora and it only lists cymosa and farinosa. It doesn't list caspitosa and, and uh, nor does, uh, interesting, nor does calflora. Well, it's there. <laughs> okay. No, you're the expert. That's why I'm, I'm just pointing that out that the, uh, uh, that, that two of our sources don't. So they, it sounds like they need to be updated. They do. And I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, for your audience, yeah. I, I, thanks, thanks for mentioning that. And um, you know, there are a lot of places where cespitosa gets misidentified as deadly afarinosa. Okay, we need some updating to do. Uh, yeah. Matthew Hagedorn asks, are there any deadlies that work particularly well as indoor plants? Uh, I I don't know much about that. Uh, like I said, the uh, the Edna echidna uh, does pretty well. Uh, I mean, some people are just so good, they can do almost anything indoors. Uh, but I, I think for most people, they're tough indoors. Some people have done okay with Dudley and Noma indoors. Um, uh, Cross with every other one. So if you want pure seed, you have to isolate them from any pollinators. Uh, but most of mine seem to go downhill after they've been indoors for a while. Deadly aviscida might do okay. Which taste, which are edible and which taste? I don't best? know. I have tasted edgeless and it's okay. It's a little bit salty. So Dudley edgeless. <laughs> Uh, I have no idea. Uh, there, there, uh, there's somebody uh, who's on this might be able to give you a better answer than I well, can give. Craig Burroughs in the chat says he's tried edulous. Uh huh. The best. Okay. Uh, and Devlin, do you have any? Uh, Devlin might or might uh, chime in. I don't know if he knows. I, I generally don't eat Dudleyus. I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I I just think I I would want to avoid the waxy ones, but you know that's just intuition. It has nothing to do with science. Mark Eshu asks about uh, uh, deformed leaves without signs of aphids or scales, and what whether that might be a type of mite. Uh, mites can cause problems. Um, at the beginning of a mealy bug infestation, it's pretty cryptic. Um, but both, uh, you know, mites, aphids, mealy bugs, scale, scale not nearly so often, but um, yeah, it, it could be mites or just the beginnings of a mealy bug infestation. Uh, I, I use rubbing alcohol, 70% rubbing alcohol to spray. Um, for pests, it's it's really not very effective, but it you know it it doesn't hurt the pollinators, uh, you know it doesn't hurt the wildlife. So um, 
I have tried that. And if you, if you spray a waxy furanosa or a waxy pachyphytum, all of a sudden you, you think, oh, there's nothing wrong here other than it's a little bit distorted. You spray it with the rubbing alcohol and you can see all of these mealybugs all over it. Uh, and, um, and then it all fades away. And then one tip, if you're showing plants, you don't want overspray to go onto the wax of the plant next door. If you coat it with a spray of rubbing alcohol, the wax comes back just fine. But if you get little dots of spray, then it wrecks the wax. Uh, Rachel Price asks, is there any way to tell whether an online seller is ethically raising the um, or, or using wild, selling wild plants? It's tough to know. Um, you know, the more you know about your seller, the better. Um, you know, CNPS sales, uh, you know, the stuff in the big box stores, you know, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, I'd rather have you go to the CNPS sales or the Botanic Garden sales. Uh, those, those are good places to start. Uh, some of the native plant nurseries, uh, online sellers, I just, I, it's hard to tell. And, you know, um, you know, you, you got to use your judgment. If it's a big old looking plant, uh, you know, with some sand on it, uh, you know, that's pretty obvious, but it, you know, a lot of them, it's really hard to tell. Yeah. Mike Bush says that the, he wants to know about a slide that with Dudley Averin's Hasei, whether that's a good name and where does it grow? Uh, Di Dudley Averin's Hasei is a good name. A lot of people just call it Dudley Hasei, uh, but that's, uh, that's an old use of the name. So Dudley of Irons Hassii uh, is, grows on um, uh, Catalina Island. And there's some debate about what you call the waxy ones that grow on San Clemente Island with the green form, which is the reason it was called Virens is there's a green form on San Clemente Island that's almost never grown. But Virens Hassii is a good name. Uh, it's almost a weed at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden. Uh, it's easy to grow, it comes easy from seed, it's easy from cuttings. Uh, it spreads out as a nice little ground cover in a drought tolerant landscape. Uh, so Virens Hassii is a, is, a, is a pretty good plant if, uh, if you got some that are accurately identified. Uh, Steve, uh, would you uh, stop screen sharing so we can see more folks on the screen? Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, ask a question in person, feel free to use the reactions raise hand button. Uh, while we're waiting for anybody, I have a couple of questions. One thing we haven't talked about is climate change. And I'm wondering what kind of threat climate change is to the Dudleys. Um, I'm seeing more and more damage from fires. Um, and, um, and that has to do with climate change. Uh, there is uh, more erosion uh, with sea level rise and, and some things like Dudley of Farinosa. Uh, Dudley of Farinosa almost always grows in salt spray unless it grows on top of uh, a mountain peak near San Francisco. <laughs> Uh, where it gets lots of fog. And, and, and a question about the hybrids. Uh, are, what, what, kind of, what kind of seeds do you get out of those? Uh, I get prolific seeds. Uh, and uh, if you lived near uh, a good habitat for Dudleya, I would only, um, you know, look to uh, let seed you know, things seed into your garden naturally or buy something, a local native from your uh, local CNPS uh, chapter. And, and are the hybrids as good for pollinators as the pure species? Um, hummingbirds and bees really seem to love <laughs> my hybrids. Uh, and uh, the hybrids, uh, I'm getting to where I have hybrids that bloom three times a year instead of just one time a year. Uh, you know, sort of like you get repeat bloomers in the roses. Um, and so that might be, uh, of, you know, that might help out the pollinators uh, and it might be interest uh, of interest to, uh, you know, uh, growers. 
And are, are you making these available to the horticultural trade? And if so, uh, how how can people get their hands on them? Well, so far it's it's been a challenge. Um, when I was doing in-person things, I would just uh, sell them at in-person things. Uh, some of my, uh, you know, like three or four generations ago, hybrids are being sold from the Arboretum at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and, um, um, you know, occasionally people will have, have ones. I don't know whether Poots Cactus uh, in the Central Valley ended up propagating any of the ones they bought from me. Um, but um, hopefully um, Tree of Life will start propagating some or, um, you know, some of the other folks in Southern California. Uh, Mike uh, Maggio uh, in San Diego has a few. Uh, James Davis asked a question about what Dudley species do you know the least about? The least about? Um, I have never visited um, the uh, one in uh, the um, on, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the island. I'm just drawing a blank right now. Um, one of the islands uh, in, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, some of the far Southern uh, Baja California ones mm -hmm. are the ones I know the least about. And Eve asked- uh, and, and Deadly Apostoflora, I don't know much about. Uh, Eve asked a question about the- uh, Seralvo, Isla Seralvo was the island I was trying to uh, remember. Uh, I've never been to Isla Seralvo. Eve is asking about the, the problem of, is there a problem of hybrids spreading to the wild and contaminating the, the gene pool? I think that's a possibility. Um, you know, I've done some interesting hybrids, uh, deadly uh, pulveria lenta crossed with veridii and deadly pulveria lenta crossed with uh, parva and with block many. And a lot of those are not really very um, viable crosses. Uh, so some of the crosses you might get, um, and then I saw, you know, this is just extrapolating, but I saw a lot of uh, monkey flower hybrids that were clearly cultivated from Southern California, planted on Highway 17 after the earthquake. And a lot of those died out after a while, uh, even though I was worried they were going to be spreading to our native uh, diplocus. Anyway, that's, I don't know whether that tells us anything or not. Uh, I, I think there is a concern. Um, but um, it, it's it's tough tough to figure out what's the best thing in terms of conservation sometimes. And Julie uh, says that following the Montecito mudslide, there were a lot of native plants that surfaced from the seed bank uh, where there had previously been mustard. And do you know what, whether any of those that surfaced were Dudleys? Uh, I don't know at that spot. Um, I know that some Dudleyas uh, survive better uh, from fires than others. The Dudley block manny uh, and hybrids between block manny and verity eye uh, survive better than the um, than the verity eye and the yellow flowered uh, kind of lanceolata like thing that grew next to them. So some things survive the fires better. Well, I I don't see any hands raised, so I think that is all the questions. I just, Steve, I really want to thank you. This has been extremely informative. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting example how a charismatic species like Dudleya can be so threatened because it is charismatic, uh, that, that those, those plants that kind of go under the radar screen may have it easier. Yeah. <laughs> and, than, than those that are, you know, really attractive. And, and knock your socks off. Uh, uh, so, I, I'm amazed at I'm amazed at how many people I've talked to who sheepishly tell me that they've collected them. Uh, you know, fish and wildlife, fish and game, state uh, park, national park. You know, mammologists, uh, ornithologists. <laughs> uh, you know, every every kind of scientist I've ever talked to says, "Oh yeah, I picked up a couple of those." Uh, so they are charismatic, and it, it does put them in danger. Uh, I'm not as worried about the occasional 
though I do tell people, if you find it on the ground, just shove it back into the cliff. Yeah. And they're really easy from seed. Get seed from one of your friends. And I'm down to about 5% on my battery. Oh. My charger just failed during the talk. Oh, oh boy. Okay, <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're winding it up. I, I got only... a couple more questions I can ask, but I can answer. But uh, if, if, I, if I blink out completely, it's because... So, uh, okay. uh, let me go jiggle something here. Okay. To see if I. Well, what? Can you still hear me, Steve? I can still hear you. Oh, okay. Well, let me let me give you what I think may be the last question here. Has it Matthew uh, Smith says has it been established what makes a pure species as opposed to a hybrid? Um. Well, that's a that's a long answer. Um. But um, DNA can help uh, looking at uh, the morphology of the leaves and the flowers, uh, artificially hybridizing things. I have recreated some things. There's something called Dudleya hybrid semi-teres in Baja, California, and I've recreated that hybrid. Um, I have artificially created Dudleya abramsii subspecies betini. Uh, from two things that occur near it. So you can find out things from the DNA, you can find out things from, you know, in the old days, I was, I was doing this manually by hybridizing them. And by hybridizing, you see what the hybrids would look like, because sometimes you can't uh, predict it. Uh, somebody wanted me to name a new species. And I crossed two things that occurred right next to it. And I said, oh, you wouldn't expect the deadly pulverio lenta being 50% of the genes would create these things that were so small. Uh, but the deadly pulverio lenta, instead of, you know, instead of the ex expected, created relatively small rosettes with big lower bracts. And so these, you know, these three populations that were kind of different one plant to the next, and they were tiny populations in one tiny area, they looked a lot like the hybrids that I made. Uh, and so, you know, that gives us clues. You know, if you've got a lot of money, you can, <laughs> and a lot of time, you can look at the DNA. Yeah. Um, but the definition for mammals, you know, they can't cross with each other, but most of the rest of the creatures on earth, creatures and, and plants on earth, uh, there, there may be some uh, hybridization that doesn't negate calling the parents the separate parents, separate species. Okay, I think we'll, uh, we'll stop there. And again, thank you, Steve. Let me just tell you about next month's program, which Thanks, is- Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Monday, the second Monday, August 8th, and Tony Corelli, a, a, a plant expert from San Mateo County, who's written books on the subject, is going to be talking to us about the plants of the San Mateo Coast wetlands. So uh, we will look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks for coming. <laughs>